So following my graduate studies, I landed this amazing job in a consulting firm in New York City. It was an amazing job. I loved it. It was the kind of work that I wanted to do. I loved my clients all over the world, and it was great. But there was a problem, you see. Although the feedback I was receiving from my clients was really good, the feedback I was receiving from my colleagues was not good. I mean, at the time, my colleagues would say, you know, you're really hard to work with. You're unpredictable. You're moody. You're up and down. You're stressed out and anxious. It's not really fun to work with you. You're not an effective team leader. You're not a good team member. And many of them actually did not want to work with me. Now, can you imagine receiving that kind of feedback as a young professional? That was tough. And so my response was always the same. You know what? Tough. Deal with it. That's just the way I am. Right? Well, the question is, why was I that way? What happened to me? Well, here's the short story. See, I was born in France in 1963. I came to this country when I was four years old. Two years later, I went back to France. And then over the course of 12 years, I moved 10 more times. If you did the math, that's 12 moves in 18 years. That's a heck of a lot of moves. Now, during that time, guess what? I'm the new kid. I'm the different kid. I'm the other kid. I'm always on the outside. I never belong. And the bullying and the name calling were incessant. So as a result, right, I start to feel real sense of isolation and loneliness, constant feelings of sadness and anxiety and frustration and even anger. Right? At first, these feelings creep into me, but then over time, they become me. Now, at the time that I had that amazing consulting job, I was also starting a family. Now, having a family has been one of the greatest privileges of my life. But in those early years, I didn't make it easy. Right? My wife, Janice, would often say, Alexander, living with you can be so difficult. You are so moody and up and down and unpredictable. You bring this stress and this anxiety into the home. And it's not really helpful or healthy for our young daughters. Wow. And then as my daughters grew older, guess what? Same feedback. Hey, Papa, you're so stressed. You're so worried, right? It makes us uncomfortable, and it's scary. Now, that was the feedback that woke me up. That was the feedback that drove me to do the personal work necessary to make the change in my life. And it's that personal work that had me discover the power and the importance of state of mind. So what is state of mind, and why is it so important? Well, let's begin with the definition. Real simple, right? Our state of mind is our moment-to-moment -moment experience of life as generated by our thinking and as expressed through our feelings. I mean, simply stated, it's what we're experiencing right now in the moment, combination of how we're thinking and feeling. Good. Good starting point. Now, with that, I want to add a little piece. It's a chart. It's a visual chart that's going to bring a little clarity to our concept. Now, you'll notice on this chart, called the state of mind chart, six rows. Three rows above and three rows below a dark line. That's called the neutral line. Now, the three rows above, plus one, plus two, plus three, correspond to increasingly higher states of mind. And the three rows below, minus one, minus two, and minus three, correspond to increasingly lower states of mind. Right? Now let's look at the words. These words are sample words that can help us understand what we might be experiencing at each level. So for example, minus three, we might be resigned or depressed. At a minus two, frustrated and angry or angry. At a minus one, anxious or bored. Then plus one, content and clear. Plus two, happy and engaged. And plus three, excited or euphoric. Right? Just sample words. There are many others, but we'll just use these. Simple chart, right? And I'm sure that all of us can safely say that we've experienced each one of these levels at least once in our lives. Is that right? Yeah, easy. Good. Now, with this definition and this chart, I want to share with you three key findings that came from all the years of research that my colleagues and I did on state of mind. And these three findings really opened my mind. So finding number one, ready? Our states of mind fluctuate all the time. Up and down we go on that chart, plus two, minus one, plus one, minus two, back to plus two. 
right? And sometimes over the course of days and sometimes over the course of hours and even minutes. I mean, how many of us have woken up one morning in a nice plus one state of mind, feeling kind of good, only to turn on our phone to read the email? Then seeing that email with that name on it, with that red flag, and in that very moment, experience the fact that that plus one state of mind became a minus two. We've all been there. That's how fast it can fluctuate, right? But here's the thing. This is normal. It's the human condition. There's nothing wrong with fluctuation. And it really made me feel good to know that because I thought I was the only one fluctuating. Key finding number two. You see, states of mind impact everything that we do. I mean, it's obvious, right, that life looks very different when we're above that line than we're below the line. And how many of us have experienced just how much more challenging it is to work with others, to make a decision, to manage time, or to parent when we're at a minus two compared to a plus one or a plus two, right? Key finding number three. This one's interesting. Wherever we are on that chart, our state of mind may impact those around us. That's right, our states of mind can be contagious. And this is especially true if we are in positions of power, influence, or authority. I mean, in those positions, our states of mind can impact the moods of our teams, the cultures of our organizations, or the very fabric of our families. And that's when I realized why I was receiving that feedback. You see, I was impacting so many people around me, and the feedback was appropriate. So let's summarize, right? Our states of minds fluctuate, they impact everything that we do, and they're contagious. So the question becomes, what do we do? That was my question. What the heck do I do when I'm below the line and I need to engage with people? And so doing the research, I realized a lot had been written on this, and there were plenty of methodologies and techniques, but one practice stood out. And that practice I latched on to years ago and started to do it, and I still do it to this day. It's a simple practice with three steps. And the three steps are notice, shift, and share. And it goes something like this. Ready? If we're about to engage with one or more people in a meeting or even going home, step one is to notice, check in on our state of mind. Like, what is my state of mind? Where am I right now? That's an important question, one that we don't ask ourselves enough. And then when we notice our state of mind, the question in step one is, what might be the impact of my state of mind on this engagement? See, that's the powerful question. That's the question of self-awareness, the question that I never asked myself. So that's step one. We notice and we ask the question. Now, should the answer to that question be, wow, my state of mind might not be helpful now, then there's step two. We shift. Now, many of us know how to shift our states of mind. And there are plenty of techniques out there, but there's one that I really like. It's simple, it's called breathe and reframe. So if I'm below the line and I'm about to engage, the way I shift is I breathe and I reframe, which means first I take a couple of deep breaths. Just breathe in deep. That's right, a couple of deep breaths. That brings me back to my senses. And then if I can, a couple of longer breaths, nice and slow. That brings a sense of coherence to me. Now that coherence allows me to reframe and reframe my thinking. And here's how I do it. I ask myself one of several questions, right? What really matters about this engagement, right? What's a good outcome of this engagement? How should I show up right now? What does my heart say? And answers come, and if I listen to the answers, I might just notice that my thinking shifts and so does my state of mind and there I am ready to engage. But here's the thing, step two doesn't always work. Sometimes we can't shift. Sometimes we're below the line. No matter how hard we try, we're there. So then what? How do we engage if we're below the line? Well, there's step three, and it's called share. And this is a really interesting step, and it takes some courage, and to be clear, it's not always appropriate or possible, but if you can do it, it's a game changer, and it goes something like this. If I'm below the line and I have to engage, then I must own my state of mind. That's right, I gotta own where I'm at. Own it. And then once I've owned it, right, I can share it. <laughs> what a thought. I can say, I'm stressed, I'm worried, I'm anxious. 
share it with those who you engage with, and then ask for their understanding or their support. What a concept. That's not what I used to do, but I started to do it. And I was amazed to see how people rise to the occasion and can provide that understanding or that support. And I was even amazed to see how much more they do that when the person asking for the understanding or support is in a position of leadership, influence, or power. Because you see, here's what I learned over all these years, right? What I learned is that life is not about being above the line all the time. It's not the point. Life is actually about being all over that chart. And being below the line is not bad or wrong. That's just life. It's the way it is. I mean, it's human. But here's the point. In life, we need to know where we are so we can own where we are, so we can share where we are and ask for that understanding and that support. I mean, there's power in that, right? And it's that understanding and support that I started to ask for. And thanks to that, I received an enormous gift that helped me transform from a person who used to go into his home, into meetings, stressed out and anxious and overwhelmed and used to freak everybody out. That's what I did. That was how I did it. To a person who could shift and show up in a more calm, clear, and engaged manner. And if those were the feelings I really felt and I couldn't get out of them, then into a person who could just share what they were and ask for that understanding and support. The result's been transformational. And standing here today, I must say, I feel an enormous amount of gratitude. I'm a different person. I'm a happier human being. <laughs> I'm a more effective leader. I'm a better team member. I'm a more generous friend. But most importantly, I'm a much more caring husband to my wife and a much more thoughtful, thoughtful father to my three beautiful daughters. Thank you. <laughs>